This program is paid for by the friends and partners of the Ever Living Story. Welcome to the international broadcast ministry of the Ever Living Story with Dr. Jerry Harmon. Here at the Ever Living Story, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. Jerry Harmon. So I've been doing on Sunday morning a series through the parables of Jesus, and it seems like there's no end to this. There's so many parables that Jesus taught, and um, every time I say I want to move on to something else, I look at, read another parable and say, oh, I, need, I want to preach on this. So this morning, I'm, I'm going to preach on the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Some years ago, a researcher surveyed 7,000 Protestant youths from many denominations, and they asked whether or not they agreed with these statements. Quote, the way to be accepted by God is to try sincerely to live a good life. More than 60% agreed. Next one was, God is satisfied if a person lives the best life he can. Almost 70% agreed. And then another one said, the main emphasis of the gospel is on God's rules for living. Again, more than half agreed. Is that what the gospel is all about? In my own experience talking with people, uh, you know, these things kind of bear out. When you talk to a person and you may ask him, you know, if you were to die and stand before God, and he were to ask you this one question, why should I let you into heaven, what would your answer be? Most of the people that I ask that question to, it's amazing. Even people who profess to be Christians kind of fumble around a little bit. They can't give you a straight answer. And they say something like, well, I'm basically good. I always try to do the best that I can. And, or something like, I've never really intentionally hurt anyone. Most people, including those who call themselves Christians, in some manner or way, feel that something that they do can contribute to their salvation, that some kind of good works is required for them to be accepted by God. All of the world's religions, that is, except Christianity, teach that you approach God through your, your good deeds, through your good works. And this was the main issue that caused a split in the church history. You remember the, hearing about the time of the Reformation. That's, what, that's why the Reformers turned against Roman Catholicism. Rome taught and still teaches that a person is saved by grace through faith in Christ, but it's not faith alone. They say that you can get saved by faith, but faith in itself is not enough. You have to add to your faith you have to add to it works. And so, and by the way, the Roman Catholic Church spelled out these official doctrines in their canons and decrees of Trent. Let me just give you a quote. Here's one statement. If anyone says that by faith alone, the impious or the sinner is justified in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the, the obtaining of the grace of justification, let him be anathema. You understand what they're saying there? If anyone comes forward and says that you're saved by faith in Christ, that you're justified by faith in Christ, and that in itself is enough, faith in Christ alone, anyone who says that, that that's all you need, let them be anathema. What is anathema? That is devoted to judgment. They declared an anathema against anyone who said that salvation is by faith and faith alone, that you get grace by simple faith alone. Alone. You see, the Roman Catholic Church believes that the first step in justification is the sacrament of baptism. That when an infant is baptized, um, that justification is, takes place because grace is infused into that person. That it's poured into them like some kind of substance. Uh, they, t they think of grace in, in substantival terms like it's some kind of substance that is poured out into your soul. So when you're, when you're baptized, your justified grace is poured out into you, like pouring water into a, a, a pitcher. You, are, you now have the substance of grace in you, and as long as you cooperate with the grace that is in you, you remain saved. But if you don't cooperate with the grace that is in you, if you commit a mortal sin, then that justification, that grace that is in you is killed. That's why it's called a mortal sin, because it puts to death whatever justification you had in you or whatever grace was poured out into you, then it's all of a sudden it's gone. Now, when we talk about the grace of God, the biblical definition of grace is not some kind of substance. It is the actions of God to sinners. 
It is the love and favor of God, the mercy given to two undeserving sinners like me and like you. Grace is not a substance. Grace is the actions of a loving God to sinners. But nevertheless, the Catholic Church teaches that it's some kind of substance that you pour out into your own, that's poured out into your own, your own heart. And you can have real saving faith, that's part of it, but if that's all you have, it's not enough because when you commit those mortal sins and the grace in you is killed, how do you get it back? If you lose your salvation according to the Catholic Church, how do you regain it? Well, you would think if you were baptized, and that's how you got justification, that if you're baptized again, that you can get it back. Well, they say no because whenever you got baptized, it left an indelible mark on your soul. Now, what is an indelible mark? I can't find out what exactly they mean by that. I don't know what an indelible mark is, but whatever it is, <laughs> baptism can't do it for you. So what, how do you get your salvation back, according to the Roman Catholic Church? Well, you get it back by doing works. Works. You have to do works that please God. You have to do works of penance. You have to say so many Hail Marys. You have to go to a priest and get absolution. You have to give to the poor. There's a whole list of things that you have to do to add to your faith. You see, because they say that faith is necessary for salvation, but it's not sufficient for salvation. All right? If I were going to build a fire, I would need oxygen, right, to build that fire, you know, because oxygen is necessary for a fire. But oxygen is not you know, sufficient, sufficient for just the fire itself because if all I needed was oxygen, then everything that had oxygen in it would be on fire. We'd all be on fire, right? And that's the way they, they look at faith. Faith is a necessary part of salvation, but they don't believe that faith is sufficient in itself for salvation. And so therefore, you have to add works. You have to do good things in order for you to be accepted by God. You have to do works of satisfaction in order to be justified. And so that adds an element of me doing works to be satisfied by God. And I want to tell you something, beloved, that's a false gospel. But by the way, you don't have to be Roman Catholic to believe that because there's a lot of religious people that somehow in their heart, they'll say, oh, yes, I believe that we're saved by faith. In fact, you go up to a Catholic today and you start telling them you're saved by faith. They say, oh, I believe that. I'm saved by faith in what Jesus did. And yet, in their heart and in their mind, they're still doing works, hoping that those works will cause them to be accepted by God in terms of salvation. In other words, they're trusting not in Christ alone, but they're trusting also in themselves for salvation. And so, Jesus gives this parable to people like that. In, Matthew, in Luke chapter 18, verse 9, notice what it says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So notice here that Jesus is giving this parable to the very people that think that they can do something that would, some religious work that would cause them to be satisfied before God and accepted by God in some way. And so what does Jesus do here? Jesus is going to give a parable where he will contrast a very religious man with a man who sees himself as nothing but a sinner. And I want you to see a series of contrasts that Jesus gives. First of all, there's a contrast in people. Look in verse number 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. So they go to the temple to pray. This happened twice a day, basically every day at 9 a.m. And every day at 3 p.m., you would go into the temple to pray. Morning and evening sacrifices were made during that time. This is all prescribed in the first chapter of Leviticus. This is a very important thing to do. You would go, you would make your sacrifice. Once the sacrifice was made, then you would go and you would pray there in the temple. But notice there's the Pharisee. In verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed. So there's one is a Pharisee and the other is a publican. Now, what is a Pharisee? Now, we have heard that term a lot, but the word Pharisee actually comes from a Hebrew word, which means separated, and it's the idea that they lived a separated life. They were separated unto God, or at least they thought they were. 
In the New Testament, they were characterized as people that had kind of this spiritually elitist attitude where they thought that they were religious and they were better than others. They were prone to be self-righteous. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus' strongest condemnations were towards the Pharisees who had this outward form of being religious, but in their heart they were far from God. Um, Jesus pronounced woe on them. However, but you have to realize that in that day, they were looked upon in a positive light. The people saw them as being very religious people. They were kind of the good guys in their day. They were highly esteemed in Jewish society. Why? Well, because they would memorize the Scripture. They had many passages of Scripture. Uh, They would memorize. They would wear these boxes, these leather boxes on their right wrist and on their forehead, um, which had Scripture verses in them. They would pray at least three times a day every day. Uh, At the same time, they would fast twice a week. On Mondays and Thursdays, normally they would fast Uh, And by the way, in the New Testament, the Pharisees made a a, a habit of fasting in public so they can be seen of others. They would put ashes on their faces to make as though they were, look look as if they were pale from their fasting. Uh, It was kind of more of a performance for them. They they tithed everything that they had, even the herbs that were from their garden. And they were just just known for being very religious and praying just, you know, very publicly. I remember flying on a plane to Israel with a lot of Orthodox Jewish men. And at a certain time on the plane, they all stood up and they all went to various corners of the plane and they just faced towards Jerusalem and they all prayed there, standing in the aisles, praying on the plane. I can pray very well from my seat with a seatbelt on. But they stood up and they made it a kind of a public thing and that was kind of like the Pharisees back in their day. It was very, very open. But then we have not only a Pharisee, we see also a publican. Now, what was a publican? Just as the Pharisees were looked upon in very positive terms, the publicans were looked upon as the opposite. They were looked upon in very negative terms. A, a, a publican was a tax collector. And tax collectors in Jewish society were the scum of the earth, literally. Literally. They were despised. They were the IRS, the Israeli Revenue Service. (laughs) People did not like the IRS back in that day. Why? Well, Rome was the one collecting taxes, and they collected three kinds of taxes from people, land taxes, head taxes, custom taxes. And there was also a three-tiered tax system where Rome got its cut, but then Rome would hire Jewish men They would be the chief tax collector, and under them they would hire other tax collectors to go out and collect money from the people, and each of those groups got their percentage. The the individuals who went to collect the taxes, the man who was in charge, and then Rome got theirs. And these men that were under Rome, they had the freedom to up the percentage however they wanted. And so they were were just, just taking money from people. They were taxing people high and pocketing the profits for themselves. And The Jewish people considered publicans to be a traitor. Um, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Remember when he was converted, he said, if I ripped anyone off, I'm going to pay them back fourfold. And Jesus said, you know, you're very close to the kingdom of God, Zacchaeus. And so as a result of the high taxing, as a result of, you know, these tax collectors going out and just taking money from the people, I think the best way we could equate it in our day to day would be like a mobster going out and collecting his due from people. You know, they were hired thugs to take money. They were merciless in taking taxes from people. The Jewish people hated them. They were the outcasts of society. And here we have this publican that comes to the temple also to pray. So you have a Pharisee, a very religious man. You have a publican, someone who's very despised, considered to be an out-and-out Sinner. There's a contrast in people, but then there's also a contrast in prayer. Look at verse number 11. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican over here. I'm glad I'm not like him. So notice the prayer of this Pharisee. He stands. He wants to be heard. He wants to be seen. Uh, This is the sense here. He draws near. 
No doubt he's wearing his religious garments, uh, the, the, the self-righteous robes. He's wearing his phylacteries, the boxes on the forehead and the wrists. He looks very, very religious. He begins to pray. It was loud enough that everyone could hear him. And also notice that he prayed within himself, the Bible says, thus with himself, or we could translate that he prayed about himself. This was really more of a self-congratulatory type prayer. God, I thank you that I am like I am. I thank you that I'm not like others. Oh, what a good person I am. And notice the five personal pronouns, I, 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 I. This is all about him. This guy had an eye problem. It was all about the religious works that he performed. He was informing God of how good he was. Why did God need to be informed about that? Didn't God already know that? He knows all things, right? Well, yeah, God knew that, but the people around didn't know it. And he's not talking to God, is he? He's talking to everyone else that are there. I thank God that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. And I think that there's some truth in that prayer. I think he was a moral man. He was not a swindler. I think he probably treated people fairly and, and was not unjust. He was faithful, perhaps, to his marriage vows, a decent man. And uh, I think folks would be impressed by this man's outward religion. And uh, look at verse 12. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I mean, people would be impressed by that. The Old Testament required fasting once a year. But here, this Pharisee, like others, he fasted twice in one week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Again, he tithed on everything, even his herbs and spices from his garden. He would tithe and give to the temple. He did more than the law required. He went above and beyond the call of duty. And so he took credit for his religious deeds, thinking that those deeds in some way would make him satisfied, uh, or make God satisfied, I should say, with him. But notice the prayer of the publican in contrast. Look in verse 13. And the publican, standing far off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you can see the contrast there very easily, can't you? I mean, the, the Pharisee's prayer is loaded with words. It's verbose. It's loquacious. But this publican's prayer, it's only six words. And it's to the point. It's short Whereas the, the Pharisee presented himself as a very righteous person, the publican sees himself as he is, nothing but a great sinner. And his prayer is simply, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, in the Greek, the article is in front of the word sinner. So we could say it like this, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He didn't see others as sinners. He only saw himself. I am the sinner. In other words, I am the worst of sinners. I'm the chief of sinners. The Pharisee was proclaiming loudly his righteousness, his works of satisfaction. The publican was publicly proclaiming his sinfulness. If the people could hear what the Pharisee was saying about himself, perhaps they also overheard this man. I don't think he was speaking loudly, but I think he was speaking directly when he said, I am the sinner. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He offers no excuses for himself. He offers no explanations for himself. He offers no self-justification. He has no illusions about himself. He doesn't have anything good that he wants to tell God about regarding him because he doesn't see anything good in him at all. All he sees is that he is the greatest of sinners. You see, when a person is truly convicted by the Holy Spirit about their sin, that's how they see themselves. Nothing in my hand I bring. That's what this publican could say. I'm not bringing anything in my hand. I have nothing in which I can bring to you, God. Nothing. He sees himself as absolutely bankrupt of goodness. Absolutely nothing but sin. And he's not trusting in himself or any of his deeds to get him into the kingdom of God. In fact, he knew that he was on his way to hell, and he knew that he deserved it. He understood that. 
There's a sense of desperation in the prayer of this publican. We see a contrast in people. We see a contrast in prayer. But also, here's number three, we see a contrast in the posture. Notice the posture of these two men. Notice that the publican would not even come close to the altar as the Pharisee did. The Pharisee came close. The publican stood afar off in verse 13, which means a distance away. Whereas the Pharisee, he was very close to the holy place, as close as he could get in into the inner court. Because in his own mind, you know, to be the closer you got to the inner court, the closer you were to God. And in his mind, he deserved to be close to God. He's earned that with all of his righteous works and all his good deeds. On the other hand, the publican, he stands far off. He's way off on the fringe. He's on the outer edge. Um, I need to be careful here. When I came in this morning, there were some people sitting in the back row of the church before Sunday school, and I, I said, good morning to all you back row Baptists. <laughs> all right, this doesn't mean the people who are in the back row are not unholy, all right? I just want you to be, want to be clear about that. They're godly people. But to put it in our day-to-day, this guy, he was afraid to even come into the church doors. He's, he's sitting close to the door. You ever hear people say, I'd come to church. I don't want the roof to fall in on me. Well, they were joking about that, but this man, he wouldn't get close because in his mind, he didn't even deserve to be there. He saw himself as such a sinner. He had no right to draw near to God. And the Pharisee stood up and puffed out his chest, but the publican looked down and beat on his chest. In verse 13 again, he would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast. He was humbled over his own unworthiness. Normally, it was not uncommon for Jews in this day when they prayed to lift up their heads towards heaven. That was kind of the posture. We see this reference several times in the Bible. Unto thee, I lift up mine eyes, O Lord, the psalmist said. I lift up mine eyes. That was a a decent posture. It was okay to do that, except if you felt particularly sinful or humbled over your sin, you wouldn't lift up your eyes. You would drop your head. And... uh, This man, he smote upon his breast. According to Alfred Ellersheim, the great New Testament scholar, this Jewish man, he said that uh, this is is something kind of unusual, the fact that he would hit upon his chest in that way with his eyes cast down. It is a gesture that expresses extreme sorrow, extreme sorrow. He felt sorrow over his sin. Uh, And why did he hit his chest? Well, because, why not some other area of your body? Well, because he knows that this is the problem, our heart, isn't it? That's where sin comes from. It comes from without of the heart. Remember what Jesus said, for out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. That's the things that defile a man. So he's smoting on his chest because he realizes that he is a sinner. He's humbled. He's sorrowing over his sinfulness before God. The Pharisee came to God based on merit. The publican, he comes to God for mercy, for mercy. You know, a lot of times we need to be careful when we go to the Lord in prayer to realize that the only reason we can even approach God in prayer is because of the mercy of God. We have no right to, to be in his holy presence, other than the fact that Jesus bore our sin. He, he, he took our sin upon himself, and it's only because of the mercy of God that we can even approach him in prayer, not on our merit, but on his mercy. But the Pharisee comes on merit. This man comes asking for mercy. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The word mercy is from the Greek word, which means to propitiate or to satisfy The word was used when the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. You remember that in the Old Testament when the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. He would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. That was the place on the Ark of the Covenant between the outstretched wings of the cherubim. And, you know, that was where God's wrath was appeased or satisfied when he saw the blood. Remember, in the Ark of the Covenant was the law of God that we had broken. And between the law of God and God looking down is that blood. 
And God would see the blood and his wrath was appeased. It was satisfied. And that all pointed forward to what? The cross of Christ where on the cross Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself and he appeased, he satisfied, he propitiated the wrath of God for us. And this is what the, this man is referring to when he says, be merciful, propitiate me for my sins. What is he saying? God, please apply the atonement to me. Please apply the blood to me. So this is what this man is asking. Have mercy on me. Cover my sins with the blood. Remove your wrath from me because of the blood that was shed. Have mercy. He knew that God was a holy God. He knew that God's divine wrath was on him because of his great sins. And the merciful removal of God's divine wrath, that was his only hope. And let me just tell you here today, dear friend, that is your only hope and that is my only hope. That and nothing else is not our works that do anything that can satisfy that holy wrath of God. Nothing that you do, no religious deed. If you're doing religious deeds thinking that some way that's going to make you justified or satisfied before God in terms of salvation, friend, you've got your hope in the wrong thing. It's in the wrong thing. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. I cling only to the cross of Christ. I hope only in what Jesus did. The Pharisee approached God with boldness. The publican approached God with brokenness. You see, the Pharisee, he was very bold in his approach. He was happy to stand with his arms out and his face up to God, assuming that he was uh, certainly acceptable to God. He could even look eyeball to eyeball with God, he thought in his own mind. But the publican would not lift up his eyes. He was overwhelmed with his guilt. His posture shows just how sinful he realized that he was. Um, he, feels the feel, he feels excuse me, the full weight of his alienation from Almighty God. But then I want you to see the last thing here. There's a contrast in people. There's a contrast in prayer, a contrast in the posture. But then there's a contrast in pardon. Look at verse 14. I tell you, I love when Jesus says that. I tell you. Why does he say it like that? Well, because Jesus speaks with authority. If he says it, it's done. The other rabbis, they were quoting one another constantly. This rabbi would quote this rabbi, this rabbi. Jesus didn't quote any rabbis. He didn't need to quote anyone because he was the final authority. Jesus said, I tell you. To watch an extended version of today's message from Dr. Jerry Harmon, go to everlivingstory.org. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. This is the Ever-Living Story with Dr. Jerry Harmon.